right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insights interview. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Johannesburg, South Africa with Gilan Gork. Hello, Gilan. Hi, John. How are you doing? And guess what? This is a first for here, us here at Sales Pop. Uh, Gilan is a mentalist, uh, which is exciting. Last week, I actually had uh, another guy on, Anthony Steers, who's known as the telephone assassin. Now I have the mentalist. I feel like I'm putting a Netflix show together. <laughs> We're like the Avengers, yeah, right? You know. <laughs> so my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRN. So uh, before we start, because we want to talk about influencing people, uh, Gilan, can you just uh, give us a brief outline of what a mentalist does? Well, you know, most people are familiar with the term mentalist because they've seen the TV show sure. uh, with you know Patrick Jane, yeah. uh, actor Simon Baker, and. Uh, you know, the term mentalist is actually a marketing term. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, there's no course or formal degree to be suddenly, you know, qualified as a mentalist. You get people around the world, some are amazing with, with memory and they can mm -hmm. call themselves a mentalist or amazing with maths. For me, uh, my passion is in reading and influencing people. And uh, because in, you know, in my kind of early career, I started out just demonstrating this for companies uh, just to show the power of influence and it was quite entertaining. Uh, the term mentalist just stuck. It, it was a great <laughs> marketing term for that context. And, uh, and so it stuck. But a mentalist is typically anyone who does something with the mind. Right. And for me, that's reading and influencing people. So a lot of nonverbal communication, psychology, and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you're the, uh, you're the author of the best-selling book, Persuasion Games. And let's face it, uh, when it comes to sales, a lot of it is about persuasion. So let, let's talk a little bit about um, your approach and what you tell people and help people in terms of how they can be more persuasive, maybe more believable, maybe more authentic. Yeah. I mean, every single day we are either persuading or being persuaded. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's part of every interaction, you know, whether we, whether we know it or like it or not. Look, the first thing that, that I, I think just for completeness to say is uh, whenever people hear about the title of my book, Persuasion Games, mm -hmm. uh, they always say, well, what are the morals and ethics around this? You know, what, what, game, what games are you playing in people's, <laughs> with people's minds? And so, um, you know, t uh, words like uh, influence, persuasion, and even manipulation. You know, when you hear the word manipulation, John, immediately you imagine something questionable happening, right? Sure, sure. Uh, but, but let me ask you a question. If you saw a mother or a father um, manipulating their child to look both ways before crossing the road safely, would you think twice about that? No, no, I think that was good parenting. Exactly, right? And so actually, uh, manipulation, uh, influence, persuasion, these are neutral terms. And the analogy that I like to use is that of a surgeon's knife. It can be used for great good or for great evil. It depends on the person using the tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the tool itself is, is neutral, right? Uh, just like those words. And so if you look at uh, the best managers in, in the world, I mean, though, that's a, a series of manipulations, isn't it? Sure. To get people... Uh, you know, along a predictable line. And so at the end of the day, it all comes down to the intention. So everything that I teach when it comes to persuasion, influence, uh, is all about creating win-win uh, scenarios, mutually beneficial outcomes. That's the acid test, you know. Right. If you're creating a win-lose situation and you're trying to be the winner, that would be negative manipulation. And that's what's going to come around and bite you in the butt because, you know, as they say, uh, everything comes out in the washing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's when you lose all influence when you when you don't uh, uphold those values. So um, absolutely, I believe that influence is the number one skill uh, to help us increase our effectiveness in every area of our lives, and especially sales. I think sales uh, and, and marketing, and you know, these are obvious applications of, of influence and persuasion. But you know, everything in life uh, revolves around working with people and uh, you know that bridge that connects you to your goals is made of other people who help us to get there especially our clients and our customers who we need to buy from us mm -hmm. so this is why i'm so passionate about it uh you know influence has had a massive impact just in growing my career uh to the point where i could release the you know the best selling book mm -hmm. Uh, and have now presented in uh, almost 30 countries around the world. So it, it's, I'm absolutely passionate about it. And, and I'm happy to go through any of my influence approaches or philosophies with you, if you like, on this call. No, yeah. I, I think, I think that would be great because I think that, um, you know, it's getting harder and harder for salespeople out there because 
there's a perception now from you know buyers that products are commoditized services are commoditized there's not that great a difference between them and if you really believe passionately that your product is the right one for a, for a buyer but but you just lack those persuasive skills that you're talking about what are what are some approaches you can take to improve that Great question. And, and I agree with you, especially in today's modern era of technology. Uh, and, and if you think about how many messages and how many people and companies are trying to persuade us and influence us all sure. the time, uh, we need to be able to influence people as rapidly as possible just to give us the opportunity to prove ourselves and, and to actually have them try our products and our, and our services. Uh, so I, I, I believe that that's the first place to start. And so I think probably the best thing for me to do is perhaps to share with you uh, my approach, which is called the mentalist rapid influence model. Uh, and and uh, this is what I've used to build my career from being basically a broke entertainer living at home with my folks <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, to being a global speaker and, uh, and, and, and having a wonderful so, uh, lifestyle that I'm yeah, very grateful for. No, so. so this would be great. So for anybody who's in your parents' basement right now and looking for a way out, you should pay attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and if you are, I mean, what I'm about to share with you, I, I share with some of the, the largest institutions here, not only in South Africa, but around, you know, Europe and Asia and America. So really, this is applicable, what I'm about to share, whether you are, whether you consider yourself as just starting out and, and small, so to speak, or, or big, you know, or wherever you are in a company. So, um, as a mentalist, uh, you know, one of the things that I love doing in my live performances when I have an audience in front of me is uh, I try experiments uh, to try and read and influence people in the audience. Uh, influence them to think of certain things or to say or do certain things, which is quite fun. And, and this is because I'm, I'm super passionate about trying to understand what people are thinking even when they don't realize that they're thinking it right. and in some way influencing that as well. So people have heard of uh, subconscious influence or uh, unconscious uh, behaviors and influence and so on. So this entire model, what I call my MRI3 model, uh, mentalist rapid influence, is based on three subconscious questions that people are asking themselves about you or your brand or your particular product or service. Uh, they're asking themselves these three questions all the time, every time they interact with you. And they may not even realize that they're asking these questions. Why? That's why they're kind of subconscious. And sometimes, because that's not a logical process uh, or a conscious process, sometimes the answers is just a gut feeling that they get uh, or a subconscious uh, uh, feeling. So, the faster you answer these three questions in people's minds and their hearts, the, the quicker you're going to establish influence with them. So here are the three questions. The first question is, are you reliable or can I rely on you? The second question is, are you capable of helping me? And the third subconscious question is, do you care about me? Right. So are you reliable or can I rely on you? Uh, are you capable of helping me? And do you care about me? And it's fascinating. I, I actually have a, a, a Venn. I love my Venn diagram. So <laughs> give, me, give me anything. I'll try and make a Venn diagram out of it. But I have a wonderful Venn diagram, um, which really shows how when you put two of them together, uh, they form trust. So, for example, if you're able to answer in somebody's mind or, or their heart, their gut feeling, that you are reliable and that you care about them, right. that actually starts to form trust. And if you're able to demonstrate that you are uh, reliable and that you're capable of helping them, that starts to form credibility. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to uh, show that you are credible and that you care about them, that gives a, a feeling of support. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you have credibility, trust and support come together, right in the middle of that Venn diagram where those three come together is where you get your ultimate, ultimate influence. Right. And, um, and so – the, the goal whenever I'm trying to influence people uh, is to answer those three questions as rapidly as possible, which is why my, uh, my model is called Mentalist Rapid Influence. <laughs> so, I, you know, if we have time on this, uh, sure. on this call, well, I can share with you some of the things that, that, 
that do that quite rapidly and the the, the psychology behind it but that's the approach yeah. to answer those no I, yeah no i'd love to spend a little bit of time on that so we will so let me just talk to you just for a second you you touched on trust right and trust is I think one of the hardest things to establish, um, especially in a buying scenario, because buyers are naturally defensive. Uh, you know, you don't want to make a mistake. Uh, you know, there could be a lot riding on it. And we've become predisposed through culture or popular culture to mistrust salespeople anyway, right? So, so just on that piece alone, um, how do you how do you manage to establish trust um, quickly with a with a prospective buyer? Well, it really depends on what the uh, what the mode of or what the platform is, what the sure. communication. So give me give, give me a well, scenario. Is okay. it face to face? Is let's, it online? Let, yeah, let's what? start let's start face to face. Say you and I are having an initial meeting. You know, you've agreed to see me. Um, I want to talk about pipeline or CRM to you and. So, uh, so in in the first instance, we sit down. Like, how can I quickly establish trust with you? Right. So, firstly, if it's a face to face, the trust is already starting leading up to that that meeting. Uh, you know, the analogy that that really I like to imagine best is if you imagine that you have a, a pocket full of silver coins, mm -hmm. and every time you do something like uh, you contact somebody and you say, great, I'm going to send you this information. And then you don't land up sending it. Or I'm going to call you back in, I'll call you back in half an hour with that answer. And, and then you land up not calling back or, or at the end of the day, every, you know, depending on how big or small those, sure. those little transgressions are, uh, it's like taking a piece of silver out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do things that are, you know, really you know, take a lot of silver, you could take a handful of silver, you know, and other times it could just be something small where you're taking out one piece. But once that silver starts depleting, then that trust, you know, you're kind of on shaky ground with, with that. So the first thing that I would, uh, uh, that I just like to share is that trust is something that is accumulated and earned. And similarly, it can also be over time, uh, uh, you know, taking the silver out your pocket. And so it can be destroyed over time. Um, but if you want to create rapid trust, so uh, for example, if you're sitting down with someone and you want to really uh, create that uh, quite quickly, then you can start to use methods that are either direct or, or indirect. So let's talk, for example, on, on, on a principle of influence, uh, which has to do with um, social proof. Okay. And social proof is a fantastic way to uh, to do this. So um, uh, let me share with you quickly an experiment that was done by by a psychologist. Okay. Uh, his name is his name is Robert Cialdini, and uh, he conducted an experiment in hotel uh, rooms. Now I, I don't know about you. I do a ton of traveling. Sure. Anywhere that I go in the world, there's a little sign hanging up in the bathroom that says, "Please." Use your water. Oh, sorry, yeah. please uh, be careful with water or reuse sure. your towels. Yeah, yeah. It's an environmentally friendly yeah. Right. So this is what they did. In a, in a hotel room, they had the cleaning staff uh, check off with each room um, which guests were reusing their towels. <laughs> and they, would, uh, uh, they did this with the entire hotel room. They had five different versions of this, of this sign. So the first four went something like this. It was uh, help the hotel save energy mm -hmm. or help save uh, resources, you know, for future generations right. or partner with us to help save energy, right? So there were four signs that were along those lines and uh, hotel uh, towel reusage went up on average 16% when they used one of these four, uh, four um, signs. And then they had a fifth sign and the fifth sign is read like this. Please join your fellow guests in uh, helping save the environment. And then in small, it said there 75% of guests who participate in our resource saving program reuse their towel more than once. Now, they got that statistic from a specific resource saving program that they ran for a small amount of time. They found that if people stayed for four nights or more, they reused their towel at least once. Anyway, they took that statistic and put that in there. And, and the towel reusage went up on average, 44% mm -hmm. when they did, compared to just 16%. And so what they basically did with that sign was to point to what other people were doing right. to create the social proof for that because we're hardwired that if we believe lots of other people believe something mm -hmm. or think something is good or something is true, then we start to believe that as well. 
uh, in psychology, it's got quite a cute name. It's called the the wisdom of crowds. Yeah. Uh, I prefer to call it the hopelessly misguided opinions of crowds because because <laughs> <laughs> popular yeah. opinion can be you know yeah, misled. Yeah. <laughs> but the point the the point, John, <laughs> that I'm trying to make here, and that's so clear through this experiment, is that if you're able to show that lots of people believe something, we don't even need to hear them saying it. Just the idea that they believe something right. is enough to, to do that. If, if we want to amplify that even more, by the way, add similarity into it. I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say you're searching for a product online yep. and, and, and you, uh, go, you come across a few different websites. Uh, I don't know how much you know about kind of Facebook pixel marketing and everything, but they, they tag your pixel. Yep. You're mm -hmm. on Facebook. Suddenly you see a zillion ads following you around yep. for this product. Yeah. And you see two identical, for the identical product, two different companies, their ads come up. Uh, this first ad has got uh, 100 people that like the page or the company mm -hmm. or, the, sure. or the advert. This one has 20 people. Which one influences you more, the one with 100 likes or the one with 20 likes? Oh, with the one with the 100, obviously. The 100, right? Mm -hmm. But now let's say that these 100 are anonymous people. You have no idea who they are. These 20 people are your friends. Oh. Now which one influences no, you most? No, it's the 20. It's the 20. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you can see how similarity can amplify that, 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 uh, that principle. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting down with someone and you want to establish trust really quickly, there are ways that you can either directly, so a direct way would perhaps be by uh, having someone read through some case studies or yeah. some testimonials mm -hmm. or stories. Story is an amazing way to drop little hints mm -hmm. of these things. And so if you can get that person to at least feel that other people believe that you're trustworthy, then that is at least a, a great start along with the fact that leading up to that meeting, you have displayed that uh, you're reliable and that you right. care about the person. So obviously that will help develop that trust. And then of course you've got to, you've got to keep that up because you can, you can lose the trust even if you're able to, uh, to get it, you know, really quickly in the first place. So I hope that gives you at least no, something no, that, to No, it about. does. And, and uh, uh, one other one I'd like to touch on is that idea of persuading people that you actually care. Because I think this is a, you know, there's empathy and there's things like that. But I think that's, that's one of the hardest ones often for salespeople to overcome because at the end of the day, there's always that little voice in the back of the buyer's head that says, yeah, but you're, you know, you're getting paid to sell this. So yeah, yeah I kind of <laughs> think you care, but at the same time, I'm not so sure. So how do you overcome that? Well, there are lots of logical explanations. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason why they're so difficult to, to act on them is because emotionally, it's risky to give. Because to show that you care, you have to give. Yep. And, uh, and especially if, uh, if you're not sure people, you know, if you've got, a, let's say, a ton of leads, and if you haven't qualified them properly, uh, to begin with, sometimes you might have been burnt in the past by giving to lots of people who land up not buying from you. Mm -hmm. So people then, especially in sales, start feeling like, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to give without them giving something back uh, uh, first uh, because I will end up wasting all my time. So let's just assume that you have been qualifying your leads. Let's say you've got a, a, a bunch of leads and you know that they're qualified to buy from you. Okay. Um, one way to start developing that care is through uh, activating the influence principle of reciprocation. Mm -hmm. And so the principle of reciprocation is that we feel the sense that we ought to match one positive action with another positive action. And uh, this is hardwired into us. Uh, if you speak to anthropologists, this is, I mean, you talk about people being sales professionals. How did professions even begin? It began because in early civilization, I got really good at doing this one thing and you got really good at doing that one thing. And then we did it for each other. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's hardwired into us that if someone does something for us, we want to, we want to do something back. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll give you a, a, just a really cute piece of research that's been done. I love, uh, you know, behavioral economics and all of these social experiments. Uh, so let me give you one that was done by uh, Professor Dennis Regan uh, of Cornell University. It's, it's famously known as the art appreciation experiment. And so try to put yourself in the, in the picture, right? Here's what, here's what they did. They had a, a subject and an assistant. And the assist, sorry, the, the subject and the assistant were asked to go through this art appreciation experiment, which took about a day to complete. What the subject did not know was that the assistant was in cahoots 
with the researchers. Okay? Now, they would go around and do this experiment, and at the end of the art appreciation exercise, should I say, at the end of the day, the, uh, the assistant asked the subject to buy some raffle tickets. So, you know, hey, John, listen, great meeting you, cool spending a day together here. I'm selling some raffle tickets. You want to buy some? Okay, so that's the first scenario. The second scenario was practically identical, except halfway through the day, the assistant, who's in cahoots with the researchers, just stepped out for a few minutes, came back a couple of minutes later, said, listen, I needed to step out, ask the researchers if I could just step out for a moment. I actually bought myself a cold drink, and I got one for you too. Here you go. And we just give the subject a cold drink. At the end of the day, again, the assistant would ask the subject if they want to buy some, some raffle tickets. Um, I mean, it's obvious. If I say to you, which group sure. do you think bought more? <laughs> I wouldn't be asking you that if the, yeah. <laughs> if the answer wasn't. So obviously, the, so the group that got the, uh, 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 the cold drink, and by the way, no mention was made. It wasn't like, hey, listen, I bought your cold drink, so now you owe me. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, give yeah. some raffle tickets. But they bought around two and a half times more raffle tickets than those who did not receive the cold drink. And so re, uh, uh, looking into this research, what they found is that even if, even if the subjects did not like the assistant, so they found that the subjects that didn't like the assistant still bought on average as many raffle tickets as those who did like the assistant. You, had, you, you see that people will respond to reciprocation even if they didn't ask for the favor, mm -hmm. so that the subjects didn't ask for the cold drink, and even if the return favor is at a higher expense, right, that people still feel. So we know this about reciprocation, that if you give first, that people will want to give back to you. Right. And we know that giving first also shows that we care. Right. Okay, so just to be clear, it's not a case of I'm giving to you now, you owe me. Sure. It's a case of you're going to give and give and give with knowing that it's going to come back to you and that, uh, and that people will feel like they want to give back to you because you're a giver. Mm -hmm. And the reason why uh, you know, I believe a lot of people know this logically, but they don't actually act on it is because it's risky to be the first one to give because sure. there's no guarantee yeah, that other yeah. people are going to give back. Mm -hmm. But the research, the research definitely shows. And I mean, if we had more time, I could I could share with you lots of <laughs> really cool experiments. But um, but but you know, research does show that if you are the first to give, it activates the principle of reciprocation, and people will want to give back to you. Mm -hmm. And so there are look, there are certain nuances and subtleties sure. to really amplify that. But in in essence, that's the principle. So if you want to really show someone that you care and develop that as part of creating trust be the first to give right. it doesn't have to be a physical gift it could be giving up your time your ip giving ideas giving favors even giving concessions mm -hmm. because giving a concession is the same as giving so there's lots of different ways that you can give to people and just be a, the type of person who does give um and and so that that would definitely if by the time you've met with someone you've given them something or at the time that you meet with them, something that's maybe personalized. Sure. If it's unexpected, mm -hmm. they're gonna. It's gonna help build that trust. Yeah. So, so be the first one to activate that reciprocate um, reciprocity. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're bumping up at the end of our time here, so I wanted to give you a few moments to tell people more about yourself, how they can find out more about you, how they can get in contact you and contact with you, and the kind of services you offer. Sure. Well, thanks for that. Um, well, as you heard, my name is Gilan Gork, and uh, my website is gilangork.com. Uh, that's G-I-L-A-N, uh, like the city of Milan, but with a G. And, uh, and Gork is G-O-R-K.com. Uh, and on there is a, a lot of information and connections to my social media if people want to connect with me and, and chat. And, uh, you know, essentially, I, I'm passionate about equipping people to really unleash their influence. And uh, I help people around the world. Uh, sales is one of my favorite groups of, of people to interact with. I, I had a, a lot of fun in Colombia at the World Sales Forum. There's just an energy about sales people that I absolutely love. It's probably because I am one myself. That's, that's kind of how I built my, my career. So I would say if anyone wants to connect, ilangork.com, lots of information about my talks and training. And I have an online course in sales and marketing that's, uh, that's just about to launch with uh, some free webinars that I'm, that I'm doing. So. Yeah, Excellent. it's all listen, on there. Yeah, listen, thanks, Galan, and it's obvious you know your passion comes through, and uh, hopefully you'll come back again. We'll uh, talk some more because I think there's a lot of lot more areas we could go into. Um, so thank you for today. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pipe Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, and I'll see you all for another expert inside interview really soon. Thank you.
Ciao. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.